The Evil Within released in 2014 to mixed reception, with praise going towards the atmosphere and gunplay, while being criticised for the story and its many inconsistencies. I called it one of the worst games of 2014, and upon revisiting it, I was a little bit more positive to the game while still stating my reasons why I think the game still isn't very good. Contrary to what I thought, it turned out to be a contentious viewpoint. I didn't expect the video to be flooded with feedback stating that people thought Shinji Mikami's possibly final game was quite good. There was stuff that was agreed upon, and others that were heavily disagreed upon, and depending on your viewpoint, my Evil Within video might likely be the most unintentionally controversial video I've ever made. Just to be clear, I don't want to make videos that rile people up. I did it before with Fallout 4 despite the best of intentions, and I've learned that those videos more or less do long-term damage. Still, it was really weird seeing 99% of comments disagree with what I had to say, and in a way... I'm kind of relieved. I was actually getting scared of the possibility that the videos and the comments would more or less turn into an echo chamber, consisting of Miyazaki good cage bad content, and to see so many people disagree with me was a surprising relief. So, it turns out that I might actually be the only person who didn't go through that door during the initial encounter with Laura, and I'm quite surprised actually. I decided to look at a multitude of Let's Players to see if I could find just one who didn't go through that same door, and I didn't. I was genuinely surprised. I do have my reasons why I didn't go through it, and I'll reiterate that I encountered the same door that connected two important rooms in the safe area earlier, and it was locked. Combined with the universal warning sign for prohibited, I got the connotation that the doors bearing that symbol would be locked. It's why I didn't go into a small room earlier in the level, because it had that same texture. I deserve all the flack for that one, but I want you to understand why I did what I did. I thought it was also a good way to segue into the running theme of inconsistencies of the game, hence why I harped on about it. In addition, upon looking at the reaction to the video, I think I personally didn't adequately get across that I was going back into this game with a heavily negative bias. So... I'm sorry, genuinely for that. I hated The Evil Within when it was released, I kind of still don't like it now, but I want to reiterate that I did like a bunch of things upon my replay. Of which very few of them appear in the first DLC, The Assignment. I remember thinking that the base game of The Evil Within would be akin to then-recent horror titles. You know, less emphasis on combat, more on hiding and puzzle solving, like Amnesia, Outlast, or the first level of The Evil Within itself, and in a way, that's what they're going for here. First problem is that the controls aren't adequately designed with pure stealth in mind. Little things like changing camera perspective from the right side to the left with a press of a button would have been good enough, but you don't have that, so there are moments where you're guessing which way the enemies are turned, because you can't change the perspective of the camera. You also have no weapons, with the exception of axes that are scattered around the twisted mind of Ruvik, but Julie Kidman doesn't get the idea to use said axe to fight back against enemies unless you sneak behind them. Like the base game, there's just so many little things that irritate me. Here's a nice little idea, Tango Gameworks. You've finally put a cover mechanic in the game. And I do like that Kidman has a little reaction for when enemies are near, but why didn't you insert a button that allows you to move around a corner while remaining in cover? Or how about a button that allows you to cross from one cover to the other? Deus Ex Human Revolution came out over three years prior and had those same cover mechanics, so it's not like there wasn't enough time time to implement them. Unfortunately, with the game containing no weapons or upgrade mechanics, when the game is at its worst, there is no satisfying shooter mechanics to fall back on, so there are going to be times where you are relying on trial and error as you wrestle with the controls and cover mechanics, hoping that this run will be the one where you achieve your goal. What I said about enemies finding you after seeing maybe a pixel of you feels amplified here, especially during the section where you have to wait for the power to return to the elevator. And guys, when I said that the upgrade system was flawed, both mechanically and in context, the solution goes beyond just removing the mechanic altogether. 
As a result, you're going to find yourself getting exhausted very quickly, because that 3 second sprint limit is back, and for DLC that emphasises more on stealth and running away, it becomes a giant hindrance. In essence, what I liked the most about The Evil Within is not in the assignment, and I've never played the DLC before. The story was almost as confusing as the base game, but it does establish that Ruvik has the capacity to maintain several stable world-sized illusions at the same time. In short, some of the weird behaviour of your partners in the base game is now explained, since it's established that, while they may cross paths occasionally, no one is seeing the same thing. It also nicely establishes, if you find the right audio log, that the STEM system at Beacon has wireless capabilities, and that Dr. Jimenez activated it. Finally, a reason as to how we entered that first illusion layer I mentioned in the previous video. I don't want to get into the assignment because it's actually part one of a two part story, and the result is that the ending, much like the base game, is a little deflating. I did like the Joseph battle, but when it's over, it's like the game woke up from a nap and rushed to get its work clothes on. I was hoping that my concerns could have been addressed in the consequence, but a good portion hasn't. The consequence came out the month after the assignment, so I wasn't expecting any sweeping changes, but I was hoping for some little things, like increased running speed or some instances where the stealth could have been improved. But there wasn't even that. It's confusing too, since there are chase sequences in both DLC that had Kidman sprinting for a good while. It's a little inconsistency, but a jarring one nonetheless. Stealth systems are still janky, and it's most exemplified by your encounters with the Shade. Don't get me wrong, I like her in principle. Her design is visually and thematically great, it's unnerving during her introductory moments, and certainly deserves a better game than this, because most of my deaths in both DLC where during the sequences where you have to wait for power to be turned on. Those moments where you have to hide from the shade as the power turns on are some of the most frustrating sequences in recent memory because of the pixel detection nature of this game. I both love and hate her final encounter. It's a basic final boss encounter that pretty much every player of video games will be familiar with, and it's something you get a hint of during a survival encounter in the assignment. But explain this to me. Looking at the light the shade emits blinds you, and there isn't anything wrong with it. It slows you down once it shines on you, so it encourages you to take a more stealthy and tactical approach. But why do you get the same effects when the light shines on you, when you're facing away from the shade? It's just really weird, you slow down like you're blinded just because you see your shadow, it just doesn't make sense to me. The consequence also cements what I think is the most irritating part of the game that I left out of the base video. Leslie is the worst part of both the game and the DLC, because he doesn't get into his head that maybe he should not blindly run away from danger when his saviour is in the same room. I swear, every time I encounter him, I bring out a sigh of frustration, because I know he is either going to run away or trigger a switch that forces us into an encounter. I understand that he's a traumatised patient, but his behaviour and speech patterns are more akin to someone with autism, and by that I mean the worst, most stereotypical portrayal of the disorder that wouldn't look too out of place in an Adam Sandler comedy. If it's not a mute then it's got to be one who constantly repeats words and statements right, it's not like there's a wide range of symptoms and behavioural patterns with varying degrees of effectiveness. Now nah, let's go for the dependent kind with shakes and whom can't stand still for one second. Okay, sir, major tangent aside, I wouldn't get too attached to Leslie, because this boy doesn't give you any form of benefit or satisfaction in both gameplay and story. And sadly, he is the most important character throughout the game. Fortunately, things do pick up when you get your hands on a pistol and shotgun, and suddenly my running thoughts on the game improve greatly mainly because the gunplay is polished in a rough yet engaging way. It is truly unique, and the closest I can find to a similar feeling system is Dead Space, which is one of my favourite games of all time. Aiming feels snappy without it losing the game's tense atmosphere, sound effects are spot on, and headshots are satisfying as hell. I'll admit that during times where you are fighting off hordes of enemies, that I was having fun with The Evil Within. Beyond gameplay, the two-part DLC package does a nice little 
job of at least attempting to make not only the story more understandable, but also tries to decipher the more confusing and cryptic elements of the game. By the end of the DLC, I had a confident grasp on the story and the way this world works, while also succeeding in building intrigue for the sequel. They also finally gave those disconnected memos from the game some flavour. It might not be much, but at least it was addressed, and as a result, aspects of the game that felt out of place, like those memos, now feel more in place with the rest of the game. This might be because they got a different writer and director, who also ended up directing the sequel. The game is not afraid to at least have a little sense of humour about itself. I audibly laughed at the moment when my gun was taken away from me, even if it's meant diving back into frustrating stealth mechanics, just because it was so video gamey. But there's also a joke ending that flat out says we should stick to the script. And finally, while I will deride the story for a lot of reasons, the DLC has something that the main game sorely lacked, and that's a character arc in our protagonist. By the end of the base game, I didn't think Sebastian actually changed in terms of personality, and I didn't think he learned much that could be applied to his life after the game ended. In contrast, the arc Kidman goes through is evident. She goes into STEM hell-bent on her mission, and it ends with her questioning her employer, their motivations, her place in not only a company that may consider her expendable, but also in the lives of other people. And she comes out by the end a changed woman. The DLC is about her, and while I do think the final boss's final form is Crash Bandicoot levels of cartoonish, her encounter with jittery, corrupt versions of herself proves to be a wonderful contrast. On one hand, you have the by the books Kidman following orders, as Kidman did going into STEM, and the other is one affected by the reality of knowing her mission could jeopardise the real world. I liked that. The ending felt more satisfying as a result, and I hope this is something that might be applied to the evil within too. But before we get there, there's just one final DLC to go through. The Executioner. It might be about Judy Kidman again, but I think it'll be about Joseph Oda. After all, he was unceremoniously dumped out of the main plot, and the fact that Kidman has killed duplicates of him means that Oda has his own tale to tell. So what did we get? Oh Jesus Christ, what in God's name. Okay, I know my previous video proved to be contentious, and I have a good feeling that a lot of you are going to disagree with my points regarding the assignment and the consequence, but can we agree that The Executioner is terrible, both as a standalone game and as an Evil Within DLC? I've ragged on about how the previous DLC played, but at least it felt like DLC to this game. The Executioner is bad in the same way amateur mods are bad. It's a bad beat-em-up where you play as the Keeper, which already screws up the symbolic nature of the Keeper in the base game because it represents Rubik locking away his inhumane secrets, and your job is to kill major bosses from the base game, and Joseph Oda. It controls clunkily, the writing is terrible, the movements are wretched, and uh... Why was this made? I've seen bad DLC before, I've played bad DLC before, but The Executioner is the definition of a hack job, pumped out to make the season pass look more like an attractive prospect. It's also boring as hell, hence why I didn't finish it. I'd normally finish things that I don't like just so my credibility won't be damaged by making explosive claims, but after finding out after clearing several rooms of boss fights that I would likely have to clear out another set of rooms full of boss fights, I had had enough. In conclusion, if you liked The Evil Within, you'll possibly like the assignment and the consequence, because it both adds to the story while giving you a chance to know more about Judy Kidman, whom wasn't explored that much character-wise in the base game. If you can brush off some frustrating stealth elements and sequences, you'll likely find great satisfaction. If you want more action out of The Evil Within, you'd be better going through New Game Plus with the little extras you unlocked after playing the game. 
just stay away from the Executioner. I cannot think of any demographic of player who would find that trite either enjoyable or satisfying. Thank you for watching. If you have any feedback, feel free to comment down below. Part of this video wouldn't exist without your feedback, so thank you guys for telling me my mistake in the last video. Your comments are always appreciated. I'm going to start work on The Evil Within 2, as well as some other projects I've had in mind, but until then, good night.